Well, a very, very warm welcome to all joining us today from across the world. This is a virtual BIS SARB centenary conference. It only happens once every 100 years, so listen up. I'm Francine Lacroix from Bloomberg, and before introducing our wonderful panel, there are a few house or platform rules to highlight. First of all, microphones must remain muted throughout the session unless you're ready to ask a question, of course, unless you're one of the panelists. Uh, the floor will be open for questions after we've heard from the panelists and attendees can also post a question in the chat. You can ask a question by clicking on the icon located in the bottom right corner of the screen. Also, the session will be recorded and then published on the SARB and BIS social media platforms. Now, today we talk on a subject worthy of a once in a century conversation, monetary and financial stability challenges to central banks banks in the wake of COVID-19. Now, central banks globally relaxed monetary and financial policies to offset the extraordinary shocks of COVID-19 pandemic, introducing unconventional policies and new instruments. As a sign, of course, of this early success, much of this accommodation now needs to be unwound as economies recover and inflation reemerges. And yet now setbacks to recovery are likely as a fourth wave of virus resurfaces and policy normalization carries new risks for both developed and developing economy. So today, at the conclusion of the Centenary Research Conference of the South African Reserve Bank, we hear from leading central bankers. The governor of the South African Reserve Bank, Letizia Caniego, the U.S. Federal Reserve Chair, Jay Powell, and the ex-governor of the Bank of Mexico and general manager of the Bank for International Settlements, Augustin Karsten. So thank you all for joining us today. Let's start by talking about inflation and growth outlook. Uh, Mr. Augustin Karstens, is a higher inflation in many countries still a temporary problem? Uh, well, uh, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Francine, for, for chairing this, this panel. It's a great pleasure to be uh, with Jay Powell and Leseja Canyago. Uh, I would start uh, by saying that uh, we, we, we have had uh, an uneven recovery, but also an uneven performance in terms of inflation. Uh, it is natural to think, uh, I mean, natural to, to imagine ourselves that uh, the, the, we went together, in many different countries went together to, into the COVID recession, but the way out has been differentiated. Uh, countries are uh, evolving at different speeds, uh, also because uh, there are other very important factors that have differentiated them, like, for example, the access to vaccinations and the, and the policy spaces. And some countries are more vulnerable to, to, to bottlenecks than others. Uh, there has been some, some I, I, I think that the, the key issue here is that there has been really a very important set uh, in combination of uh, bottlenecks and real sector shocks that have, uh, uh, have impacted pretty much all countries in the world. And uh, pretty much all of these uh, shocks have I think they're, they're transitory. They have to do precisely with the dislocation of markets that resulted from the pandemic, but also some, some very specific aspects in some markets. Uh, but at the same time, there are other countries that have been subject to, to other type of inflationary pressures. Uh, in, and in some countries, in particular in some emerging markets, they have faced the need to start tightening monetary policy. So I would say that Global, glo many, many global uh, price uh, pressures that uh, affect the commodity, commodity markets that affect supply bottlenecks and so, so, so on. I think that they are transitory but persistent. And, and, and in many advanced economies, pretty much in advanced economies, I, 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 I still believe that the, the shocks are uh, also transitory. All, although a uh, persistent nature uh, as, 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 as of today. Thank you so much, Mr. Carson. Chair Powell, how confident are you that inflation will return to 2% next year compared with your confidence a month ago? And how much of that decline in inflation would be due to increasing supply versus declining demand? So, thank you, Francine, and, and uh, it's uh, great to see you, Lasetia and Agustin, as always. Um, and I'm, uh, I would say, roughly in line with uh, the comments that, uh, that Augustine made. But so if I may just start with, with global activity, uh, it continues to rebound, supporting, supported by uh, rising vaccination levels and the reopening of economies. The IMF and many other forecasters generally call for strong global growth over the next year or so as the pandemic wanes and economies return to more level, normal levels of activity. 
However, it's a very uneven recovery. Uh, that's partly vaccination. It's partly policy space, as Augustine pointed out. And emerging markets are, are well behind uh, uh, advanced economies. Uh, the, the key factor globally continues to be uh, getting past the pandemic. The Delta variant forced a number of countries to re-implement restrictions, which slowed the recovery and further interrupted global supply chains. Those effects are diminishing now, but as economies reopen, supply bottlenecks are still weighing on production in some industries and boosting prices, contributing to that higher inflation. So as, as the Delta cases decline, we do expect progress to speed up, although we can't rule out the possibility of another spike this winter. Here in the U.S., it's, it's a very similar story. Very strong demand this year on track for 5 percent growth. Uh, like elsewhere, the Delta variant uh, temporarily slowed the economy's progress in the third quarter, keeping people from resuming public activities and, in some cases, from returning to work. Job growth slowed sharply. Q3 GDP is, is going to come in lower than we thought. Um, so as the wave passes, my expectation is that job growth moves back up to closer to the high levels we saw last summer and the reopening of the service sector continues. That may be slower and take longer than we thought. Meanwhile, bottlenecks in the tangled supply lines are holding down activities in some sectors, particularly automotive, and the combination of strong demand for goods and the bottlenecks has meant that overall inflation is running well above our target, even though inflation for services is not unusually high. So to your question, um, is higher inflation temporary? Our view has been that these factors are likely to abate. The ones I just mentioned are likely to abate as the pandemic subsides, as spending rotates from goods to services, as people go back to work, and as supply constraints are resolved. Of course, our tools don't work, uh, don't do much on supply constraints, and as is obvious, I assume, it's very difficult to predict the occurrence of, of, of supply constraints, supply side constraints, or how long they will, they will take to, to abate. And in fact, lately, rather than improving, supply side constraints have actually gotten worse in some cases. So uh, we've also had labor supply issues, and now we're getting, uh, we're getting upward pressure on energy. So, so where does that leave us? Um, so I think in the U.S. and in other advanced economies, with these supply constraints and shortages and therefore elevated inflation, they're likely to last longer than previously expected, likely well into next year. And the same is true for upward pressure on wages. But it is still the most likely case that as supply side constraints abate, as they eventually will, and as job gains move back up, inflation will move back down closer to our 2 percent goal. In the meantime, the risk is that ongoing high inflation will begin to lead price and wage setters to expect unduly high rates of inflation in the future. And if we were to see a serious risk of inflation moving up persistently to higher levels, we would certainly use our tools to preserve price stability while also taking into account the implication of our maximum employment goal. Um, so we're there, we therefore need to make sure that our policy is positioned to address the full range of plausible outcomes. We'll be watching mm -hmm. carefully to see whether the economy is evolving in line with expectations, and our policies will need to adapt accordingly. We are on track to begin a taper of our asset purchases that, if the economy evolves broadly as expected, will be completed by the middle of next year. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Powell. Governor Kanyago, you've warned of upside risk to inflation outlook. Is this an adjustment of supply to the changes in patterns because of the pandemic, or is it something that could actually stay in the longer term? I, I thank you, Francine, uh, for, for facilitating this, and thanks for Jay and uh, Augustine for, uh, for joining the panel. I, I think that from an emerging market perspective, getting into the pandemic, what we didn't have is the problem that the developed economies had, which were to struggling to get inflation uh, inflation up. And um, yes, you had the COVID shock and in the midst of the COVID shock, what you then had was that uh, there was a shock to the inflation and many uh, emerging market economies found themselves with fairly low uh, inflation uh, during, uh, during the shock. As the economies were opening up and uh, vaccinations were taking place in the uh, developed world, uh, you saw that economic activity was resurging and coming out of the lockdowns, those supply constraints started to be uh, to be binding. Uh, when inflation started to rise in the developed world, it looked like the emerging markets, this was not uh, about to happen, but it was a matter of time before it caught up. Because if these constraints were in the global supply chains, these prices will eventually, uh, will eventually transmit. And as the situation stands now with uh, uh, what is happening with energy prices, what is happening with uh, uh, the food prices, you are going to see that 
uh, inflation is going to go up. And for the emerging markets, though, is that this might be combined with a depreciation of uh, currencies. And when you have that with a depreciation of currencies, uh, then inflation uh, could, be, uh, could be going up. And of course, the other is that as the developed world normalizes policy, there is bound to be a realignment of exchange rates and there is got to be a repricing of financial assets. And all of those are also going to fit themselves into uh, the inflation outlook. The policy response naturally is that you see through uh, those shocks, which means that a judgment about whether the issue is transitory and whether the persistence becomes important. And that is where judgment uh, uh, comes in. And, um, uh, and you, you take it from there. The judgment at the moment is that uh, it is transitory. And should we see any sign of persistence, policy is bound to respond to that. Uh, Mr. Carstens, if you look at some of the economic conditions and the outlook in general, is it definitely is it improving? Just... If you leave inflation to one side, even as we're going to the winter months, is it improving? Yes, definitely. I, I think it's improving. Uh, I think that we are building up on the different signs of strength that uh, have been out there uh, since uh, the, 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 uh, since the middle of, of last year. I think one positive aspect is that financial markets uh, have uh, been working well. Uh, I think that the performance of markets has stabilized. Another very important sign is that in many latitudes uh, we have seen that the corporate sector has been quite strong. In many places the, the earnings of some corporations have been strong. A fear that we had uh, last year was precisely that we were going to have a liquidity problem and then a solvency problem, with, which meant that many, there was the possibility of firms to go into bankruptcy, but we really haven't seen that. Uh, and also we have seen very strong uh, demand performance, as uh, some of my colleagues, my colleagues have, have said. So, uh, so far I think so good. I think that 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 what we need to focus in now or, or in the in the in the months and years to co to come is is that we need to understand much better how aggregate supply works and uh, in some cases try to identify what could we do to make uh, the global economy less prone to these type of supply shocks. I think we have done a very good job in terms of managing aggregate demand, mostly through a fiscal and monetary policy, but more, more work needs to be done in terms of a aggregate supply. And I would add to that the necessity to preserve open borders and to pre preserve free trade, because I think that uh, it's essential that, that, that goods and services flow well in the global economy. Thank you so much. Um, Chair Powell, I want to ask about the outlook for policy, but I also want to make sure that your connection is crystal clear because we had a couple of issues in the last couple of minutes. But you said last month that the process of scaling back the Fed's asset purchases could begin as early as your meeting in early November. Since then, the data has been a little bit mixed with the employment report for September coming in weaker than expected. So do you feel that the taper threshold has actually been met for the next meeting or, you, or do you still need more time to assess how the economy is actually coping with the Delta variant? And I guess as, as uh, we had an audio problem and maybe didn't hear, I think that we are on track to, be, to begin a taper of our asset purchases that, if the economy uh, evolves broadly as expected, will be completed by the middle of next year. And that means that the test for substantial further progress toward both of our goals, maximum employment and price stability, will have been met. Yep. Chair Powell, I think we need to reconnect with you. I, I understood what you said, um, which is you're on track, but we'll reestablish the connection and get back to you very shortly. Governor Kaneago, how should central banks actually respond to the inflation outlook? Is there a risk at, at the moment of really falling behind the curve? That is uh, uh, a possibility, uh, but we got to make judgment. And we have so far done very well. And I think that um, we must accept that policy is in a, uh, 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 executed in a very uncertain environment. And as things stand, our take is that uh, our stance is appropriate for, uh, for the current environment that we are having and given, given the outlook.
but there are risks on the horizons. And in our previous policy meeting, we spelled out those risks, and those risks have to do with energy prices. They have to do with some domestic factors, which has to do with uh, the pricing by utilities, and they have to do with uh, the risks to the realignment of exchange rates and what could actually happen uh, with exchange rates. And if the, all of those things combine together, you are going to have um, a serious problem of uh, inflation actually uh, materializing. Should that be a risk that the, the rise in inflation is persistent and not transitory, there is no question that a policy uh, will, have to, uh, will have to adjust. Whether you are behind or uh, ahead of the cap is always going to be a judgment call. It's never an easy thing um, uh, to do. But what you can't, to, you can't do is to act uh, preemptively or um, uh, uh, hastily in a manner that chokes uh, the nascent, uh, nascent economic recovery. But that said, we must also be cognizant that if inflation, the rise in inflation brings persistence, it's important that policymakers act with resolve. So, Mr. Carstens, what could be the consequences, actually, if central banks fall behind the curve? Sorry, Joe? I think you're on mute. Question. Hello, hello. Do you listen yes, to me? Can you hear me now? Do you, can you? Excellent. Yeah. No, what I, first of all, I, 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 I don't think that central banks will fall behind the curve. Uh, I think it's something that in the recent months, uh, markets and many analysts have forgotten is that the track record of central banks in terms of fighting and preserving uh, inflation has been very, very good. Uh, even in, in, this is a very important uh, comment in the light of uh, this this forum where we are talking about the, the South African Reserve Bank 100th anniversary. I think if there is a country that exemplifies uh, how successful can be the fight against inflation is what the South African Reserve Bank has done. They have been very successful in tankering inflation to inflation targeting and so on. And as you have heard from Lesetia, uh, they're pretty much on top of the issues. It's a difficult time. I mean, we, we knew in, in, in the different uh, central banks, in, the, in different type of central banks, that it, it's difficult to, 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 to think about the, few, the next steps uh, because there are very important trade-offs that need to be taken into account. Uh, uh, the central banks will need to be very sure that we are really fighting uh, definite inflationary pressures. Uh, because otherwise the risk would be to probably uh, affect the recovery uh, unnecessarily. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I think also some of the problems that could, uh, could, could uh, present themselves in, even in the, case, in, the, in the remote case that some central banks would fall behind would be to have some uh, consequences on financial stability and at asset pricing. But at the same time, I have to say that uh, central banks have been uh, pretty much all over the place, and particularly in advanced economies, have been very skilled in trying to explain to the markets and present to the markets what is what they're seeing ahead of them and how are they planning to, uh, and when are they planning to adjust their, 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 their use of the instruments. So to mitigate some of the problems of falling behind, if at all, uh, I think forward guidance uh, is tremendously useful and powerful. Thank you so much, Mr. Carstens. Uh, Chair Powell, one of the points, of course, made by critics of the Fed's implementation of the new monetary policy framework is that because the committee risks tightening rates too late until you all are confident that labor market is well past full employment, you may then have to do more when you start tightening. So this, this risks an increased chance, I guess, of a recession. How do you respond to that? Th that's a basic misunderstanding of our framework. Our framework, uh, if you go back and look at, at it, what it was designed to do was deal with the case where labor markets got tighter and tighter, but inflation didn't react. And that's the, that's the situation we've had for a number of cycles, particularly the last one. Uh, this is a very different situation. And uh, the situation now, of course, is that uh, we're still 5 million jobs below the level of February 2020, so we're not at maximum employment. Um, 
uh, at the same time, inflation is is not moderately, but but well above target. So it's not the situation that that uh, you know that sort of patient approach was specifically and and you know uh, clearly designed for. This is a different situation. This is a situation in which the two uh, the two sides of our mandate are uh, they're somewhat in tension, and we actually covered that in our framework. And what it, what it says is that. When the, when the two goals are not complementary, you know, ordinarily when inflation is high, that means a tight labor market, and when inflation is low, that means low. That means a lot of uh, labor market slack. This is this is where you have a labor market slack in the presence of high inflation. What we do is we take into account the employment shortfalls and inflation deviations, and the potentially different time horizons over which employment and inflation are projected to return to levels consistent with the mandate. So that, that's what we will do. It's, uh, so that it, again, it's, not, it's a misunderstanding of our, of our uh, framework. But let, let me say, getting to, to your point of being late, employment 5 million below where it was before the pandemic. If you, if you say, well, how far is it below trend job creation? It's actually 7 million plus. Uh, nonetheless, the labor market is very tight by many measures. Um, and that is partly because it's taking time for workers to find new jobs and be partly because many people are still holding off work uh, for now due to COVID. So while it, the time is near now for tapering our asset purchases, it would be premature to actually tighten policy by raising rates now with the effect and intent of slowing job growth when there's good reason to expect a return to robust job growth and for these supply constraints to diminish, both of which would have the effect of increasing the potential output of the economy. Now, now that said, of course, uh, we, I, I do think we need to be patient, but we also need to be watching very carefully, and we are. And that goes back to what I said earlier, uh, to get ourselves in a position where, where we uh, can, can address the full range of plausible outcomes, and, and the taper gets us there. Governor Kanyago, after such a prolonged phase of exceptionally easy monetary conditions, do you actually expect it, it will be possible to exit from such a stance without causing disorderly market reaction? It's, uh, it is possible to, uh, to exit. I think that what, what we need to be clear about is that the exit from these policies is not going to be time dependent, but rather that it is going to be state dependent. And so central banks have got to be able to assess um, the state of the economy, the risks to the inflation, and respond uh, appropriately. And different central banks will be faced with different situations depending on the extent of the stimulus that they had done and the initial conditions from which uh, the exit has got to take place. Second issue is that uh, as you plan to, uh, to exit, uh, what August, the point that Augustine had made earlier, earlier on, that it is important that there is clear communication uh, about uh, the nature uh, of uh, uh, of the exit. And I must commend Jay here and, uh, and his team at the Fed, because I don't think that we have got a risk of a 2013 taper tantrum. The communication from, uh, from the Fed over the past few years have been exceptionally better than what uh, we have seen uh, in 2013. So, so exit, yes, we will exit, but I do not think that the exit will be a disruptive one. Thank you so much, um, Governor. Uh, Chair Powell, I have quite a lot of questions for you with just a very simple question, and I hope we can hear you well, because sometimes it, it's hard of hearing because of the connection problems. I'm sorry about that. It's a very 2021 uh, kind of problem. But I'm getting three questions saying, are, are you absolutely certain, um, Governor Powell, Chair Powell, that the Fed is not behind the curve? I think we don't live in a world of absolute certainty uh, in the economy or in monetary policy. I would never say that. Uh, uh, about anything, any part of the job that we do. So uh, I think if you, the way I would think about it is this. We have a base case, and that base case is that uh, we, we see with our own eyes that these, these, these supply constraints are, are directly connected to pandemic-related issues. So we see that, and we think that global supply chains will, will, get, will, will uh, resume function over time. We have a very hard time knowing, we don't know, uh, how long that will take. And so, and that's really, that in, in, in addition to the strong demand we're seeing is what's causing the high inflation. So the risks, so that's your base case, and that's very widely shared among macroeconomic forecasters, very widely. The risks are clearly now to longer 
uh, and more persistent bottlenecks and thus to higher inflation. So we now see higher inflation in the bottlenecks lasting well into next year. So we, we live in a risk management business, not one of absolute certainty. I would say that our policy is well positioned to manage the range of, uh, of, uh, of plausible outcomes. I do think it's time to taper. Uh, I, and uh, I, I don't think it's time to raise rates because, as I mentioned, I just said, it would be premature to do so at a time when we are, we're far below the level of jobs that we had in 2020, and particularly if you adjust that for the trend. Um, and uh, so, again, we, we need to watch and, and watch carefully to see whether the economy is evolving consistently with our expectations and adapt our policy accordingly. And that, that is what we will do. Do you think the new monetary policy frameworks are fit for purpose? Well, I mean, I definitely think that they, they were done following a very thorough uh, research and consultation by the main central banks that have done so. I think that they are, uh, they are adjusted to the needs uh, and challenges for the future. Yes, so I think they're appropriate. I think something that was needed is, is a, a fair, a, 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 the adequate amount of flexibility. So I think, for example, the, the issue of following a, a average inflation is, is a good, is a good change. The adjustment that has been changed, that has been done to the European Central Bank a, a framework also, I think it's adequate to have a more a symmetric uh, tolerance for, for deviation. So I think, as, as always in monetary policy, there is con constant evolution. Uh, I think that uh, the different frameworks have been evolving to time, adjusting to the recent experience, adjusting how, uh, how, how markets uh, uh, behave. Uh, so I, I, I definitely think not only the, the adjustments to the frameworks have been adequate, but the other thing I have to talk very highly of is the, the process that has been followed in the different, different central banks to do this, with plenty of consultation, uh, with very good, uh, res very good openness to hear different opinions from academics and markets. So I, I, I feel that, that it was timely and it was adequate. Uh, Chair Powell, how will, thank you, Mr. Garson. Chair Powell, how will the Fed act if inflation looks to be an anchoring before full employment is actually reached? So, um, as I, I read you that we have a specific section of our, um, uh, of our framework that, that causes us to balance those two and, and to, the two goals and to ask how quickly they'll move back to target and, and how far they are from the target. I, but I've also, as I said earlier, if we were to see a serious risk of inflation moving up persistently to higher levels, uh, persistently that is, we, we would certainly use our tools to preserve price stability while also taking into account the implications for our maximum employment goal. So no one should doubt uh, that we will use our tools to guide inflation back down to 2% over time. At the same time, uh, for now, we think we can be patient and, and allow uh, the, the taper to take place and allow the labor market to heal, which we expect it to resume doing fairly shortly. Uh, as you may recall, over last summer, June, July, August, we were uh, having something like a million, close to a million, 900,000 new jobs per month, which is a nice pace. And if we get back anything close to that, then we will fairly quickly be absorbing the remaining slack. Uh, we'll also be monitoring inflation very carefully, though, as, as I mentioned, uh, and adapting our policy accordingly. Much, uh, Governor Kanyago, to, to what extent is Fed tapering actually likely to affect the SARB's interest rate trajectory? It's a, it's a fairly straight, um, uh, straightforward one uh, in terms of the channels that you can identify. Uh, but whether the things pan out in the manner in which you think about the channels uh, is, uh, is a different ballgame. Uh, to the extent that the Fed tapering is taking place because the U.S. economy has recovered and is strong, uh, a strong U.S. economy is good for the world economy, and uh, uh, as such, that should be seen uh, should be seen uh, 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 positively. Secondly, is that uh, what we would have seen is that with the strong recovery in the U.S., the growth differentials are actually in favor.
uh, of the U.S. And so if capital has to be changing direction, it is likely to, my, to be going in the direction of the U.S. Uh, driven by the growth, uh, the growth dynamics. What is in no doubt is that with the tapering taking place, uh, bond markets are going to have to readjust. And when those bond markets readjust, starting with the U.S. Treasury, uh, Treasury market, bond markets around the world are going to readjust. And uh, with that, also a movement, uh, a movement of uh, capital. And thirdly is that uh, when that happens, we expect that there will be a realignment uh, of exchange rates. And just thinking theoretically, if the growth differentials are in favor of the U.S., uh, then it goes without saying that a realignment of exchange rate could involve an appreciation of the dollar against the other. Uh, the and so that will feed itself and different countries moving from different states uh, will have to respond, uh, will have to respond uh, uh, differently. And so in the, case of, uh, in the case of South Africa, if we looked back uh, to where we were in 2013, uh, we are less vulnerable than we were in 2013. We are, we are, not, not, we are not unvulnerable. We are just less vulnerable than we were uh, then. We, we will be getting into these adjustments with a fairly strong uh, balance of payment position. We are in a current account surplus at the moment. That will unwind uh, over the next uh, two years uh, uh, or so. Uh, we had benefited from a... Uh, a commodity boom, temporary as it may uh, as it may be, uh, that gives the space for uh, the government to do uh, a fiscal consolidation further, uh, faster than they would have otherwise uh, had. And of course, the risk there is that uh, when these adjustments are taking place, we have got two risks. The first risk is that globally we are going to have uh, to get treasuries to be wing of cheap money. Because at the moment, you have got low bond yields, the cost of borrowing are very low, and whether the treasuries are using that space to make the necessary changes that has to be made uh, remains to be seen. The biggest policy mistake would be for the treasuries to pretend that this is a permanent situation and it could turn out to be a very costly uh, affair for the treasuries if it was uh, to happen uh, in, that, uh, uh, in that manner. So, with all of those things all taking place uh, at the same time, the position that we would take as, as South Africa, and I'm sure every other country will assess this, is to look at what does this mean for the growth outlook, what does it mean for the inflation outlook, and what is a reset of the policy uh, stance uh, that uh, uh, must take place. The, the, the first round of uh, these things is going to be a challenge because we've got to take a view about, uh, once again, whether this is transitory or whether there is going to be some persistence. And so we would have to take a call that uh, says, as usual, we look out for the risks uh, to the inflation outlook, we look for any presence or emergence of second round effects, and then adjust poli uh, policy as appropriate. Thank you so much, Mr. Carson. Do you agree with that? Or anything to add? Yes, yes, pretty yes, much pretty I agree much. with that. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, my friend Lesetia, uh, 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 yeah, yeah. we we share many experiences, common experiences, and it, it, it the way he presents things uh, reminds me of my time as a governor of Central Bank of Mexico, because yes, emerging markets face particular par particular issues, in particular dealing with uh, you know. Uh, global financial conditions and the uh, well of course global financial conditions are, are 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 quite influenced by the decisions that they naturally so that that the that the federal reserve uh, they take uh, there are other important issues to, to determine the the, the 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 financial conditions emerging markets face in particular that's the development of their exchange rate and there, uh, of course, local issues also play a very important role. Uh, so yes, I mean, I, 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 I think that the presentations uh, by, by Lesetia have been, have reminded me of, a, of, of my good old times as a governor of Banco de Mexico. Thank you so much. Uh, Chair Powell, how would you describe actually the Fed's relationship with markets right now? Like what, what are they misunderstanding? 
Well, so here's the part of it that we control, and that is our, our own communications. And as I think you're hearing, and as, as people know, we try to be as transparent as possible and as clear in our communications so that markets will know how we will react, not just what our baseline expectation is, but how we will react to uh, the inevitable deviations from our baseline expectations. And we, we, we really do focus on that a lot. I, I don't, we do not set out to eliminate all, I mean, the markets have to adjust as the economy adjusts and part of the way they adjust, not all of the, the way, but some of the way they adjust is through what central banks do and say. Um, we don't set it as a goal, nor should we, I think, to, to eliminate all, uh, you know, we're never going to be perfect in this and, and things happen. For example, the pandemic where you have to react really quickly. So there's not, it's not possible always to, to be clear ahead of time. So, I mean, fundamentally, I think our policy is in a good place. I think the market generally understands, uh, you know, where we are and what's going on. I'm not blessing every, every asset price or anything like that, but I feel like we've, uh, we've, we've communicated successfully, certainly. The main focus now, of course, is on the taper. And I think we're, I think the communication on that has worked. We all lived through 2013 and the taper tantrum and uh, kind of have gone out of our way to avoid that this time. I think, I think so far so good. Um, and that, that's just what we're gonna continue to do. We're very mindful of, of the effect of US financial conditions on financial conditions around the world and, uh, and on economic conditions too. So we try to communicate carefully. Thank you so much, Chair Powell. I have a couple of questions actually coming in from people listening in. Um, Governor, l let me ask you this. Are there technology changes, and this comes from someone actually listening in, um, for Governor Kanyago, are there technology changes associated with the pandemic and how businesses are adjusting to it that will change the way that central banks see inflation coming out of the labor market? Thanks, Christine. There's, there's no doubt that uh, uh, technology changes is going to affect the manner in which we assess economies, not just, not just inflation. Uh, what we have learned from this pandemic is that uh, we do not have to all be working in the offices, that we could be working uh, remotely. And, uh, and Augustine was telling a story some other time of his uh, uh, German teacher, uh, who is actually located in the US, and Augustine is in Switzerland. And, uh, and the German teacher in the U.S. is costing a third of what um, uh, Augustine should be paying in Switzerland to, uh, to learn German. Now, that changes the dynamics of the labor market completely because um, that means that uh, people are able to source labor wherever it is, uh, uh, it is cheapest. That's the first point. The second is that, of course, with the technological progress that you would have, uh, you would have seen, it changes the relative prices uh, of the factor markets uh, between labor and the uh, and the rest of the uh, uh, of the factors of uh, of production. That poses a very important uh, challenge, and the challenge thus is not just for us as uh, uh, central banks, but it is also for the broader uh, uh, government authorities about how we are going to look at this evolving world of work you're having a changing world of work and with that changing world of work labor dynamics uh, uh, dynamics are different and it is a challenge that uh, we are all going to be uh, facing but i would be interested to hear what the other two panelists have to uh, to say in particular jay given the, uh, the the scale of technological change in the u.s so i i agree with what lasetia said i would just add this <clears throat> what technology does is it raises productivity. So Augustine's German teacher at a university in the Midwest uh, can be much more productive too. And, and so can Augustine. And that, that teacher can have <laughs> students all over the world. And the, the teacher isn't driving to places and, you know, advert, it's just, it's so much more efficient. So, but what the technology demands is that the public have the skills and aptitudes that put them in a position to benefit from it. And that, that is an issue. And so what, what one of the reasons behind growing inequality in many countries, certainly in the United States, is uh, you know, the so-called race between education and technology. So educational attainment has not kept up with technological evolution. And what that means is if you're on the right side if you're, uh, of technology, you've never had better economic opportunities. If you're not, then the kind of jobs you were doing were, were going to be either less well-paid or, or 
smaller pay increases or, or they'll be automated away or they'll be done somewhere else in the world. So what, what, the, what that comes back to for me is the need to make sure that the population that everyone has access to, high, to, to education and, and the kind of training that they'll need to benefit from technology, which of course does increase productivity sort of uh, by its nature in many cases. Leaving aside social media there, which I, I wouldn't say increases productivity. Mr. Carstens, I mean, first of all, everybody wants to know how your German is getting along. But the second question is probably, <laughs> will this change the way that you see economics lack? No, my German is much better. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, it's, uh, it, it, it allows me to have more classes at, at, a, at a decent rate. Uh, I have to say I also have a Swiss professor, so I have both. Uh, I, I, I'm very intense in German right now and uh, making substantial progress. Uh, I mean, let me add, add one, one important thing, because we're here talking also in the, uh, uh, with the, with the, in, the, in the example of South Africa. And I think, uh, 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 and I want to thank uh, in particular Jay Powell to be with us today. He has always shown tremendous interest in African countries. He has joined us in other events uh, at the BIS with the with, uh, with the African representatives, and uh, it's great to have the opportunity to have him here in this forum. But one, one very important issue, I think, that many emerging markets and developing countries face is, 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 is the fact that the pandemic has affected a lot the attendance of, of kids to school. And uh, let's face it, I mean, uh, in many emerging markets, developing countries, the availability of technology is not there. And oftentimes also technology doesn't work absolutely perfectly. So it will be a huge challenge for all the world, and but in particular emerging and developing countries to make this catch up so that we don't have generations of, 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 of youths that will be handicapped in the future given the lack of education that we will have had already for a couple of, couple of years. Now, in terms of uh, what is the slack in the economy and so on and so forth, I mean, I think, I think, I think that the key issue here is, is the fact that uh, in the short term, we will be facing many, many different conflicting, conflicting signals. Uh, and, and part of that has to do precisely with the dislocation of markets that are being presented by the recovery out of the pandemic. Uh, we see we see part of that reflected in relative price changes that has been affecting our reading of inflation. But uh, at the same time, we also see that in some cases we see uh, we see a, a rising unemployment, but also bottlenecks in terms of lack of uh, of, of skilled labor in some very specific sectors. So it will take some time before. Uh, you know, we 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 manage to 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 have an adequate world in which um, the degree of slack <laughs> also corresponds to uh, uh, not dislocations in markets, in particular in the labor market. Uh, so we need to focus also in the labor market to see that uh, we don't have, uh, you know, uh, unnecessarily bot bottlenecks there. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question actually for Governor Kanyago on South Africa. How do you uh, reconcile wanting to lower the inflation target with the fact that your economy needs as much support as possible to strengthen recovery prospects? Um, having a higher inflation target is not going to give South Africa higher growth. Higher inflation begets higher interest rates. And uh, South Africa's inflation target is out of line with those of peers. It is something that South African policymakers recognized uh, as early as 2001, and that uh, it had to be lowered, uh, except that for some reason we forgot that it had to be, uh, it had to be lowered. Uh, over the past five years, South Africans have benefited from low interest rates and they benefited from low interest rates precisely because the South African Reserve Bank has been able uh, to contain uh, inflation. And uh, this is not the time to, uh, to drop our gut. Uh, 
uh, we were able in the middle of the pandemic uh, able to provide support to this economy and the reason we were able to provide that amount of monetary stimulus was precisely because we had built policy buffers and we had contained inflation and thus we were moving from a much stronger position than uh, we would have otherwise uh, have had. South Africa had previously experienced very high inflation and those periods of high inflation coincided very low growth. So the notion that South Africa could inflate its way to growth uh, is not backed up by the reality of our experience. Thank you so much. Um, Chair Powell, I have a question. I, I think you answered part of it a little bit before, but I just want to make sure that everybody is crystal clear on what you said, given some of the connection problems. Uh, Secretary Yellen said this okay. Wednesday that actually she still expects the U.S. economy to return to full employment next year. Do you share that confidence? And you also talked about wage price spiral at Jackson Hole. Are we seeing early signs of that? So, again, my, uh, my expectation is that as Delta fades and... Uh, uh, hopefully as we begin to make progress on, on uh, supply side constraints going away, that we'll see the, the service side of the economy reopening here and job uh, growth will go back to the closer to the very high levels we saw last summer. And so I think it's very possible that we'll be at or near uh, uh, conditions, labor market conditions that are consistent with uh, maximum employment goal next year. That, that, is, that is possible. It's not a a certainty and, and you know, the effect of the range of uncertainty is significant. So um, what we, some of the uh, inflation episodes that we saw um, before inflation expectations, uh, for the period of low inflation that we've been in for the last couple of decades or more, uh, some of them involved the, the so-called wage price spiral. And we, we're not seeing evidence of that. We are seeing uh, wages certainly moving up, particularly for uh, people in the, in the lower uh, brackets. Uh, what lower wage brackets, particularly in the service sector, um, we do. S companies uh, are having a hard time hiring people in many parts of the economy. Uh, we don't see that evidence of that yet, um, and and we do expect progress, as I mentioned. So we'll be watching this very carefully. I laid out a number of of lenses through which we look at inflation. We don't just have one way we look at inflation. I laid out a number of them and we're watching them carefully and others as well to see that our assessment uh, is correct. And, and as I said, policy will adapt uh, as, as we see more data and as we see how the economy evolves. Thank you, Mr. Karstens. Is secular stagnation, this is a question from someone who's following online, is secular stagnation a thing of the past and will it structurally actually change the balance of risks for central banks going forward? Well, that's a, that's a very important uh, question. It's, it's, it's a question that has more to do with the medium and long term. Uh, certainly, uh, there are uh, secular trends that are still there. Uh, some have to do with uh, uh, demographics, uh, with the technical change and so on. And those, those I have to say, uh, are still going to be there. Therefore, we will see how things play out. In, 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 in the short term, uh, certainly sh short and medium term, there are issues also that playing a very important, uh, a very important role. Uh, what I, I, my own central scenario is one in which we will still have, uh, we will have a growth with, a, with, with a transitory inflation above target. Uh, uh, but I think growth still will be robust uh, in, in the years to come. Uh, I, I think that through time we will develop the ability for supply to adjust to demand, and uh, I see demand uh, will, will, will continue to be, to be strong. But in the medium, medium term, medium and long term, I think that, 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 that uh, growth is of the essence, and uh, I think that we need to, to look very much into the details about uh, how to engineer more growth. And I think that, that on, top, on top of uh, the, the aggregate demand uh, management through monetary and fiscal policy, we need to look into those structural reforms that can uh, allow us for, for more sustainable growth. In this case, the policy to combat the climate change could be an opportunity to enhance sustainable growth. But also, I have to say, the policies that were for, that are 
are, uh, are being contemplated in the U.S. to have a very aggressive uh, infrastructure package, I think is also very, very important. Those are the type of policies that will help both uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the short and, and medium term growth, but also in terms of long term growth uh, based on higher uh, sustainable growth. Thank you so much. It's very interesting, actually, to see. We were mentioning technology before. I'm getting quite a lot of questions on actually the extent to which technology is changing the way central banks think. So, Governor, first of all, um, this person's writing in, to what extent has this changed the collection and dissemination of statistical data? And are central banks evolving fast enough to basically deal with this technological change? Sorry, who are you asking that question of? So first we'll go to um, Governor Kanyago, and then we'll go to you, Chair Powell. I was, I was hoping it was meant for Jay. Um, <laughs> but there, there, had to be significant, uh, there had to be significant changes in the manner we collect. Uh, we collect uh, <coughs> it's the issue of measuring the digital economy itself. Uh, it is a big challenge for, uh, for the statisticians. They are grappling, uh, grappling with that but also the speed with which technology moves uh, beggars the question. Uh, statisticians have this thing of re-benchmarking and uh, rebasing every five years or so, and, and whether the speed with which technological change is taking place could necessitate that uh, they do that with more frequency than they are, they are doing. Thirdly, is that last year when we had a a, a lockdown. We had to assess uh, where the economy was, but uh, we couldn't quite assess this because um, the statisticians were also asked to stay uh, at home, so they couldn't collect the data. And so we had to start uh, doing other things. And uh, uh, my staff here in the Reserve Bank developed something that they called the trachometer, where they basically started to rely on the number of trucks that are going through the gantries as a proxy of some form of uh, uh, economic, uh, economic activity. And they started to use uh, Google mobility data to look at the number of people who are going through uh, the transportation nodes to see whether people are moving and so forth. And so there was a big challenge for, for us to improvise, to look at alternatives to the official statistics as compiled. And we actually found fairly uh, interesting stuff and a lot of central banks. We are also looking at the use of, a, a, of big data and in trying to figure out this thing, how to navigate through uh, the pandemic, we are actually finding very interesting trends emerging on how we could use uh, big data, machine learning and all of that stuff uh, that would enable us to actually also an, uh, assess the economy uh, 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 faster. So the statisticians are going to be uh, are going to be challenged. There's, there's always big things now. This information is now almost available real time. And whether continuing to send people with forms to supermarkets and all those things trying to compile prices is the manner in which we are going to continue to compile statistics. So it's going to be a challenge. Uh, for the statistical uh, agencies. Um, for the central banks, we do uh, compile a limited number of, uh, of statistics. We are predominantly a user of statistics rather than a compiler of statistics. Thank you so much. Chair Powell, same question. We've been, we've been uh, collecting and, and publishing uh, data on industrial production for more than a century now. I think we just had our 100th anniversary of doing that. And it's an evolving science and art. So most, for at least the last, I don't know, since close to the last decade, we have been working and investing in getting uh, large data sets, big data, private data sets that will help us understand that really the current state, the current position of the economy. The idea is to get a better sense of what's happening in the labor market with hiring, with wages and things like that. So we, we've done quite a bit of that, and we work with data scientists in the private sector. It's very interesting. But it's, it's, what you're really trying to do, though, as I mentioned, is get a, a better sense of the current state of the economy. It's not like you can, you can get all the data in the world and know where the economy is going to be in six months with any confidence. It's just too, compli it's too complex and too difficult to forecast with confidence. So 
Um, but I, I do think we, you know, make very gradual advances in, in this world, and uh, no doubt we'll look back on this as the early days of big data and analytics, and um, we certainly pay attention to them. I'll just mention two other things, it, it, as long as we're talking about uh, digital uh, things. You know, in the world of payments, uh, digital payments is just r being revolutionized right now, and all of us are spending a lot of time on that. In addition, we have the digital economy now, so you've got uh, big parts of the economy that have been digitalized, and that, that has uh, interesting implications, and, and it's just a, it's a fast-evolving economy as retail moves more online and things like that, which we're, we're constantly evaluating. So all, all this, this area is, is, uh, is one that occupies an awful lot of uh, a bandwidth these days. Thank you so much. Um, Governor Kenyaga, I want to ask you about the, the outlook for capital flows into emerging market economies. How's that looking for the rest of the year and into next year? I, I think that it is important to, to move from uh, what the, the current conditions are. Um, what we have seen is that there is a divergence in the recovery uh, of uh, capital flows to emerging markets. Uh, you had these massive outflows last year, and in the case of South Africa, the outflows were also driven by the fact that we got uh, downgraded uh, uh, last year, and uh, combined that with uh, the pandemic, we experienced a massive uh, outflow. Fortunately for South Africa, we have got a fairly developed and sophisticated domestic investor base, which was able to, uh, to fill the gap. And for those emerging markets that do not have uh, developed investment markets, uh, they might be, might have faced uh, uh, significant, uh, significant challenges. What have we seen? What we have seen is that when you looked at emerging Europe and uh, emerging Asia, uh, you see that the capital flows are recovering and they are almost close to what they were uh, uh, um, uh, 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 prior to the to the pandemic. It's a different ball game when you looked at. Uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, including when you looked at uh, uh, South Africa uh, uh, itself. Uh, but a number of things also are, are, are driving these things. Uh, we are, in the past, we have seen massive bond outflows, and this time we are seeing, we have seen that we had massive equity uh, outflows. Now, equity outflows are very much related to, uh, to the growth story. And in the current milieu, the growth story is very much a vaccination story. Vaccination policy <coughs> has basically become economic policy. And so those countries that were able to vaccinate faster have actually also recovered faster. And most of them are actually now where they were prior to the pandemic with respect, uh, with respect to economic growth. Whereas when you look at the countries which have not vaccinated, whether it had to do with uh, uh, government or whether it had to do with access to, uh, to vaccines, those countries are uh, uh, lagging, uh, lagging behind. And it is no surprise thus that you also then see that those are also the countries, predominantly in sub-Saharan Africa, that are not seeing a recovery. Thank you so much. Mr. Karstens, how vulnerable, I think we've just lost uh, the governor in a second, but we'll reestablish connection and we'll get to that. How vulnerable, uh, Mr. Karstens, are emerging market economies to policy normalization in advanced economies? Well, uh, as we have uh, already discussed uh, here at length, uh, uh, the emerging market economies are now probably, they're, they're better, better prepared to have a normalization. I mean, uh, we, we, we commented already the comparison with the taper tantrum. I think, I think that the, that the balance of payments conditions in many emerging markets are, are much better. There are less countries with current account deficits. <laughs> uh, it, since the since the pande since the uh, taper tantrum, uh, many central banks beefed up their uh, international reserve position. Uh, their financial system has been uh, strengthened. Uh, I think pretty much uh, all emerging markets have embraced Basel III reforms. So I think that they are much better prepared to 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 face. Uh, 
the, 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 the normalization process. I have to say also the fact that the Fed has opened uh, uh, the, the facilities to 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 facilitate swaps uh, uh, and uh, and repos in treasury securities uh, is a plus. So I think I think that 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 the that the countries are are much better prepared. I want to just echo one thing that uh, that Lesecha was saying in his exposition. He's back. Uh, I think I think a lot on 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 you know not only to face the the, the normalization process, but also this this issue that we have seen already, which is outflows, is a growth story, and I think that's uh, that's that's where where many emerging markets have to pay pay attention. And I, I fully su subscribe the view of Lesecha that part of the problem is vaccination, but I also would say it's policy space that is far more limited in emerging market economies. Chair Powell, this is a question for you. How does the Fed incorporate the interactions of its actions with the rest of the world economy in general and emerging markets in uh, particular into its reaction function, if at all? So, of course, we serve, we all serve domestic mandates. So it's, it's maximum employment and price stability in the United States. And that, that's ultimately the law. That's, that's our goal. But uh, financial markets are, are very fully globalized, and me meaning that actions anywhere in the world can have enormous effects. Uh, see, you know, think of the pandemic br breaking out in China uh, and the effects that had before it spread elsewhere even to... And so to all around the world and financial and financial conditions have have very strong effects on economic activity as well so we have to think uh we we all live in the same financial system which is tightly interconnected around the globe the economies are also tightly woven together now more than they were certainly a quarter of a century ago so we we think about that uh, a lot uh, we think about it in normal times that we want to communicate clearly and and have markets understand where we're going in, in stress times, of course, we, we uh, given the importance of the dollar in, uh, in the global economy, we, we do have ways of assuring uh, the continued availability of dollar funding around the world. And we use those in our swap lines and, and, and uh, other, uh, the FEMA repo facility at the New York Fed now will serve that purpose as well. So we're, we're very mindful that, that, that we're all living in the same certainly the same financial system and the same global economy and that uh, you know we our our econ economic conditions here in the United States are very much affected by what goes on abroad and vice versa and that that is kind of always part of the thinking I think for for any large central bank including the Fed can you can we expect that you know this happy marriage between monetary and fiscal policy during the pandemic to continue in the years ahead and it also goes back to some of the questions that we're getting from people listening in in which is you know tied to that to what extent do higher public debt levels weigh on uh, economic growth worldwide uh, i'm not sure that i would quite call it a marriage uh, but uh, the the pandemic necessitated a coordination between the fiscal authorities and, and the, monetary, uh, the monetary authorities. And uh, the actions uh, reinforced each other. And the manner in which both authorities re uh, responded depended on the amount of space uh, that they have had. And I think that the world over, you have found that central banks seem to have had more uh, space to respond, and they responded with speed, and they responded uh, with scale. Uh, not, the same couldn't quite be said of fiscal authorities, especially in the emerging market uh, uh, economies. And South Africa was uh, uh, was no uh, uh, no exceptions. Just two points that one should uh, uh, bring to the fore. The first one is that it is important that in that coordination between monetary and fiscal uh, authorities, that each one of the authorities act within their limit. My fear is that because central banks have been so successful we would then think that these institutions could be used to solve all of society's problems. And I think that that would be a terrible, a terrible mistake. Second fear that I have is that because of what you have seen in the advanced economies with the massive asset purchase, uh, purchases, uh, which are done mainly through uh, central bank uh, uh, reserves, fiscal authorities are now more sensitive to changes in uh, uh, in interest rates, and when that happens, there might be a uh, 
a response that could start to challenge the independence of uh, uh, of central banks, which we would have uh, to guard uh, uh, to guard against. And uh, lastly, and more importantly, is that it is not just the issue of fiscal and monetary policies that it had to bring to bear. It was also financial. Uh, uh, policies and the countries that had responded well had been those that had been able to calibrate uh, those uh, policies and move with speed. And what is important in a crisis is that you actually need to move with speed and then recalibrate policies as you go on because you do not know what the nature of the crisis is and you learn as you go along. Thank you so much. Um, Chair Powell, there's a question, of course, because the Fed has just unveiled a major overhaul of its trading rules uh, following <clears throat> revelations by some officials last year. You've also asked the Fed's own Inspector General watchdog to examine whether trading activity by certain senior officials was in compliance with both the relevant ethic rules and the law. Is this probe by the IG still ongoing? And do you have a timeline on when these findings will be made public? So the uh, Inspector Generals in, in, in our system of government uh, our international viewers are are fully independent, have their own authority, and can investigate as they see fit. And they're in every major um, uh, sort of uh, institution that we have here. And uh, the timing of that uh, investigation is entirely within the, the control of the Inspector General of the Fed. So I can't I can't really comment on that. We're almost out of time, so I'll ask you all just in a couple of minutes to maybe share your biggest concerns over the next 12 and 24 months. Uh, Mr. Carstens, you can kick us off. And you know, given everything we've just talked about, what are you, the, the two priorities that both policymakers and markets should be thinking about? Well, I think uh, even though we have had the major progress uh, in terms of vaccination and so on, uh, we still are not out of the woods yet. And uh, I think the pandemic still will be playing an important role uh, in, the, in the near future. Um, hopefully, we will make more progress with the uh, treatments, uh, with effective treatments. I think that the recent news with the Merck treatment, I think, is very good. Uh, because I, my, my own sense is that we will need to learn to, to live with, with, <laughs> with the virus. So I think I think number one is precisely to make progress with this, uh, uh, reduce the incidence of 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 of, of the virus, and uh, allow for a, a, a normal life to be reinstated and economic activity to be reinstated. Uh, I mean, certainly, depending on the the development of the pandemic, uh, different uh, types of policies will have to be implemented. Uh, I, I am a little bit concerned in some countries in particular that policy space is becoming more limited. And, uh, and therefore, that's why I, I, I think it's doubly important to have, uh, to have progress in, 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 in the pandemic. Uh, and, and towards the medium and long term, I think that the growth story is very important. I think that we need to to redouble our efforts to understand better aggregate supply and how can we get more growth into the, 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 the global economy. And in particular, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned in some latitudes about the situation in the labor market. Uh, I mean, I think the central scenario is a good scenario, but, 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 but we still face the issues related to, to the pandemic as a, as a central uh, actor in this these next months and years. Thank you so much. Governor Kenyago. Uh, three things. Um, uh, uh, firstly, I think that uh, a message to the commodity uh, producers. Uh, the commodity boom is not a permanent boom. Like all the previous ones, at some stage, it will bust. Don't adjust your spending and pretend to be richer than you actually are. That's the first point. The second point uh, that I would like to make is that we need growth and growth is important. But growth is not a policy. Growth is an outcome of policies. And that we actually need to be putting the growth policies that we actually need that would lead uh, to the kind of growth that we are uh, actually looking for. And my fear is that this era of cheap money had actually made the other policymakers outside of the central banks to become complacent and postponed the difficult decisions that had to be made 
uh, which were supposed to have been made prior to the pandemic, and now they are, we are faced with this, and these decisions are continuing to be, uh, uh, to be postponed. And third and last is that treasuries have got to hear themselves that the cost of funds, uh, of funds is going to be rising as policies uh, normalize, and they better be able to take decisions now uh, before that time sets in. Thank you so much, Chair Powell. So me, and uh, it, it really is one thing, and that is successfully managing the economic exit from the pandemic in a, in a highly unusual situation where effectively we're missing a piece of potential output in, because of the supply constraints and, and the, and the non-full reopening of the service sector. Um, and so we want, that, we want to give full time for that to come back before we start restraining demand with re interest rate increases. On the other hand, we see that inflation is high, and inflation, of course, affects people on more limited budgets in their groceries and in their gas purchases and things like that. We see that, we know how painful that is, and we have to look through, our tools work with a famously a long and variable lag, we have to look through that and, uh, and you know, balance those two, those two issues. And so that, that I think it's extremely important that we get that right. I am confident that we will do so over the course of the next year or so. I think in the meantime, it's going to be extremely challenging, uh, certainly in the short term. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. It was a very entertaining and uh, spirited conversation looking at how central banks, of course, globally relaxed monetary and uh, financial uh, policies to offset some of these shocks that we saw because of the pandemic. We talked about some of the policies. We talked about some of the things uh, going for, forward. And of course, as much of this accommodation now needs to be unwound, I guess uh, it's up to well, inflation expectations to take hold and see how policymakers react to that and some of the setbacks that we can see. So thank you, all three of you, for joining us today. Thank you for everyone watching at home or in the office. And have a great day, everyone.